Hi, it's uh, Jason here again at the Centre for Computing History, and I'm joined uh, by Duncan Smead. Hello. Thanks very much for coming in. Sure. Um, Pleasure. We have literally just done a video all about uh, the uh, Dragon 32 computer, um, which you can watch probably listed before this one. Um, but not only uh, was Duncan responsible for um, some of the development on the, the Dragon, um, he was also very much involved in the development of the EMI Thorn Liberator. Um, and this is it. And it's not really a machine that anybody knows much about, or it is a machine that not many people know much about, or one of those two, I'm not sure. Um, it is a British uh, portable computer, which there were very few, um, and at this time, possibly no others. Um, it's an interesting machine. This is it, and this is the one we have in the museum, and it has a handle that we can pull carry out. Carry it by. So there's our carry handle, very useful. Um, and then, I'm gonna have to put this down at the back there for a second. We have the, yeah, that the lid that comes up. The handle comes up. So, as the carry handle flips over, it creates the support for the screen, um, which I think you'll agree is a fairly nifty little design. Um, so this is it, this is the EMI Thorn Liberator. The Thorn um, EMI Liberator. Thorn EMI Liberator, that too. Um, <laughs> so we've got to get these things right. So Duncan, tell us about this machine. Um, so this is the one that we have at the museum, but Duncan has very kindly brought along this one, which is an early pre-production of, uh, of the same machine. So we have the boards here that would be like that inside the case with its power, power switch just there, but opened up so you can see it. And we'll try and get some close-ups of that for you. Um, tell us about it. Okay. Uh, well, this has really come out as a result of Dragon Data needing to divest their R&D side of things in, uh, in their factory right. in South Wales at Kenfig. And uh, I can't recall exactly. Uh, I know that Tony Smith in the Register has done a really good uh, article about the first British laptop, the Thorny MI Liberator. And he's done interviews with people and so on. So that if you want the backstory for a lot of this, then check out the Register right. mm -hmm. uh, Liberator story. So to cut a long story short, essentially, CCTA, which is the civil service uh, procurement arm for IT, wanted to have a bespoke, custom-made laptop, especially for the civil service, right. to their design. And they had approached various manufacturers. Uh, so, for example, this sort of form factor uh, and so on was, was in some respects, um, pioneered by the Japanese, mm -hmm. such as Epson. Yeah. Uh, so Epson had a similar type of machine. But they, if they had been approached, had stated that it would take about 18 months to develop something like this. So Thorny and I took on about five of us from Dragon Data, okay. the hardware design team, and the system software design team, of which I was one. And so how does that work? How does this company just come along and, and steal people from, from Dragon? Well, uh, because the reality is, I think that they'd approach Dragon, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the reality is that we were looking for other opportunities. Right. So I don't know the exact details of what negotiations took the scenes place, negotiation, right, yeah. Yeah. but essentially five of us left. Right. I think uh, we were let go mm -hmm. by Dragon, and we ended up working for Thorny MI, okay. and they had a, um, a factory in Triorki, mm -hmm. which meant that those of us lived in sort of like the Bridge End or Swansea could drive there. We were set up there, and we developed the prototype for this laptop to the CCTA specification. Right. Wow. Uh, and, you know, and that, I think it was quite impressive to do because we did it in six months. <laughs> really? And um, other people said that it's impossible to do yeah. in less than 18 months. So I'm not quite sure Thorny and I 
believed us when we said we would do it in six months. Oh, so you did actually say you thought you could do it in six yeah. months? Yeah, uh-huh. oh, right, okay. And we did. Right. Yeah. It's not one of those Star Trek times. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, so, um, so, so tell me about it. From a technical point of view, what have we got in front of us here? Okay, well, it's essentially a CPM machine. Right. So it's running Z80 mm-hmm. and, and CPM. Um, so it's not running a 6809 chipset uh, at all. Right. Um, and because it's running CPM, then the software developed for CPM-based machines, word processors and so on, that could run on it. So, so I'm assuming you jumped ship because we've already done the video where you love the 6809 so much. Oh. That was much better than all the other processors. Yeah. But now we're on a Z80. Well, you know, is again, that because it's, of a, CPM? it's a commercial decision and that is to get something to market yeah. with something approaching, you know, commercial quality operating system, commercial quality uh, applications. Mm-hmm. Then you have to go with what's out there in the market. Mm-hmm. And, and CPM was already, and already CPM on CPM was season. already there. And right. so we worked with Digital Research. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they were in Reading at the time, mm-hmm. um, just along the M4 corridor. So we worked with them and developed a CPM machine capable of running CPM. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, fantastic. So um, obviously we've got the, the keyboard uh, at the, the front there. Um, we have an interesting little chip here um, with a piggyback EEPROM on it. Um, mm-hmm. So that is a... Well, it looks like that's the 6305, which is basically uh, an I.O. processor. Right, okay. Yeah. So okay. that would handle the I.O. side of things. Right. And then a, a Z80. And the Z80 is probably over here think, yeah, somewhere uh, on, the, yeah. on the other board there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to squeeze this much tech into a case, yeah. we've had to... Uh. To sort of layer the these board balls here, and yep. lay that. So you know the product designer on the team has done a good job yeah. of packaging. You know this it concept. Is, it is pretty small, yeah. um, and you know when you've got the might of people like Epson mm-hmm. producing yeah, yeah. their machines. Yeah. You know there, there was a lot of the, yeah. this was a small part of a company. Yeah producing something like yeah. this, which is you know the industrial engineering on it. You mm-hmm. know is is something. Uh, to start with, I like that you know the the, the case, the hinge, um, yeah. you know, which there is very very little to it, yeah. um, and still all in one piece today. Yeah. Um, so laptops. Of course, the major cost of developing this was being the tooling, yeah. the steel tooling. It's an unbelievably high cost to yeah. actually tool up. Um, so you know that's it's it's imperative you get that design right because mm. you can't tweak. No, I mean, well, injection tool. molding, yeah, absolutely, at the time was prohibitive yeah. to most yeah. small companies yeah. to be able to yeah. do, so ended up with computers in the steel cases okay. and everything else. And one of the reasons, of course, Thony and I would, uh, would count, uh, countenance the, the cost of going to that level of commitment was the CCTA yeah. predicted tens of thousands right. of sales mm-hmm. of these, because if you think about it, they were trying to promote them into every department in the civil service as the de facto standard for mm-hmm. civil servants. And, you know, Thorny and I bought into that. We, to a certain extent, bought into that. Um, the full story is, it, you know, in the register, but to cut a long story short, the, the civil service departments would say, yes, OK, fine, we'll take 20 and we'll evaluate them for a year. That's so a hard thing. Instead of many a, thousands, only hundreds yeah. were produced. You can't do all the tooling and, 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 all that, and ready for that. No. Not on that kind of concept. So I don't know. I honestly don't know what the, uh, the final production figures were for the Liberator. Um, but when you're working to tens of thousands of units with that huge potential and then suddenly you're told we'll take 20, 30, 40 yeah. for a year yeah. to see if they work. And at that time things were moving well. very, very quick. By the end of that uh, year... No, it's, it's just not economically, commercially viable. No. Yeah. Such a shame. It is a shame. All that effort that goes yeah. into these things. Uh, yeah. Um, and it is such a nice design as well. Mm. I mean, let's have a, a quick look. So. Uh, at the back here, we've got a couple of DIN connectors, S1 and S2 yeah. serial ports. 
Pseudo ports, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, that's the, the battery pack. So oh, it's yes. only battery. Oh, yeah, battery yeah. pack in there. Uh -huh. That needs yeah. to come out that way. Yeah. Um, RAM uh, port. Yeah, uh, for extension RAM. Expansion. So you can plug in your extension RAM mm -hmm. and, and so on. Bank B Protect. So did it store its data in kind of a battery back yeah. RAM? or uh -huh. yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Because obviously a machine this size, um, yeah. sort of conventional ways of storing any data were out there. No, that's the question. right. Yeah, basically um, you had uh, so non-volatile memory devices, essentially, yeah. to do yeah. it. Um, expansion there? Yes. Uh -huh. What was the expansion going to be? Good question. Not quite sure. <laughs> the world's your oyster. Uh -huh. Take the data. Yeah, if you don't have an expansion just... port, you can't expand. No, so. exactly. And, and that's yeah. all part of the sales, yeah. isn't it? This is fully expandable yeah. uh, via this port. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's quite funny. You see some adverts where that say, you know, via the expansion port, this machine will never go out of date. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's great stuff. It was, it's a well-engineered It is machine. It is. Yeah. Um, and uh, and such a shame that it, it didn't uh, do bigger things. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, by the from what I've heard, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it, really they had pretty much only intended it for for word processing. Yes. Anyway, they're they're, they're fairly engines for dedicated it. Um, to that, as you can see. You know the number of lines and the columns marked on the the bezel here yep. and so on. So mm -hmm. yes, it's very much geared towards just word processing. Yeah. yeah. But it was. Capable of so much more. It would, yeah. 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 So CPM the word processing was obviously inbuilt into the uh, the ROM on mm -hmm. the system, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't need to load it from disk or from a memory cartridge. It was just switched on into word processing into word mode. Processor. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed for bringing it along. It's interesting stuff. So it's it you know the, the stories about these machines that, that yeah. don't end up do anything yeah, uh, uh, equally and if not more interesting than, than those machines that do. Yeah, and there's um, lots of lessons to be learned uh -huh. from these things and that is never believe you know, the prediction of uh, sales if they sound too good to be true. Yeah, yeah. they probably are. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, so, so from d developing this, what, what actually were you responsible for? Well, this was again the, sort of the, the, BIOS, system? the BIOS side of things. Right. Uh, again, similar to the Dragon, you've got to provide a BIOS to interact, you know, with the keyboard and the I/O, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so you have node interfaces to the operating system, and well, to a certain extent, the operating system provides all the services for the applications. So yeah. it's really the underlying I/O. Right. Okay, yeah. and what was it like um, moving from six eight oh nine and then writing code for the Z eighty? Well. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of a challenge, <laughs> uh, but you know some of the stuff. One of the reasons for the sixty three oh five is that we can offload some of that stuff onto the sixty three oh five, and mm -hmm. that was quite a nice architecture as well. Yeah. So uh, some of the I/O. So sixty three oh five. I mean, is that a is it's not one I know. Is it a processor or yeah, is it it, it is just a processor? Yeah. Uh -huh. So you kind of got the same trick going on yeah. um, uh -huh. in the uh, in the dragon where you're just yes. using another processor yeah. uh -huh. to do some uh -huh. subsystem stuff. Yes. All right, interesting, yeah. interesting. And I suppose over here, I can bring it over this way a little bit. Um, was this for software expansion, so you can load different applications into it, or is that RAM purely RAM? Oh, so that's RAM. Yeah. There. Yeah. Um, the RAM. Yeah. And then you've got the ROM there. Yeah. Um, so, so could you? Because I think on the Epson machines, you could plug in different uh, EEPROMs that gave you different functionality yeah. and stuff. Was this the same kind of thing, or was it? Yeah, I think that the you know we did have a the, the uh, well that's the RAM port. So no. yeah. Uh -huh. To be perfectly honest, I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a while ago. Yeah. I, I can understand that. Um, so uh, yeah. On the, you can see on the, the ROM there, Copyright Digital Research, um, Thorny MI IT. Brilliant, there you go. So you probably won't often get to see inside uh, one of these machines because um, they're not that common anymore for obvious reasons. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there is what is uh, uh, the, the electronics of a Thorn EMI Liberator. Um, Thank you very much, Duncan, for, okay, for being here. Really appreciate it, yeah. and thanks for, for telling us the stories. And okay. um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the day. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. okay. Take care. Thanks a lot. Right.